certainly appreciate everyone's presence here this evening. Now, some of you may think I need a haircut. I don't like getting haircuts because they cost money. <laughs> but I look at myself in the mirror and I say, well, I'm either going to have to put out a hit song or become a uh, criminal defense attorney, one or the other. Well, speaking of uh, criminal activity, the greatest criminal activity there ever was is sin. And it was first introduced in the world by Adam and Eve in the sinless setting of the Garden of Eden. We read in Genesis, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast in the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now the, the appeal to Eve was the illusory wish to be like God. So for sinful man it has been the case ever since. As the prophet Jeremiah wrote, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, verse 23. Because Eden was created to be a place of sinless perfection, Adam and Eve, who were now tainted with sin, could no longer stay there and were therefore summarily banished. Since then, all who have come to know good and evil have succumbed to the appeal of sin. They wish to be like God and direct their own steps in the absence of direction from the source of absolute truth, an effort doomed to fail. As the Apostle Paul wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans Third chapter 23rd, 3 verse, verse 23. And he further informed us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. So for the next 4,000 years or so, man lived under a cloud of condemnation since he could not offer that sinless sacrifice necessary to atone or expiate for his sins. God had to provide that perfect expiatory, propitiatory, and mediatory sacrifice in the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of Godhead, who became a man. Paul wrote in the second chapter of Philippians, verses 5 through 8, that this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We are exhorted to have the same mind that if obtained and cultivated, will keep us from sin. Regardless of his spiritual condition, man will, in time, acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. 
Paul further states in Philippians, the uh, second, second chapter, verses 9 through 11, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to, to the glory of God the Father. Even the demons have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, James 2.19. But they have yet to bend the knee. But they will, eventually. The great apostle of love, John, was very concerned about the sin problem. He begins his first epistle by offering conclusive evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of mankind, the only begotten Son of God. To look upon the very essence of God, one only need to look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, chapter verse 2. Philip found this out when Jesus responded to his query. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Do you not believe, uh, or the words that I speak to you, I do not speak uh, on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. John 14, chapter verses 9 and 10. What uh, words did Jesus speak? Well, in part, it was the message John stated in his epistle as recorded in 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in, in him is no darkness at all. In physics, we may not be able to define exactly what light is, but we know it has certain physical properties that can be observed. Light carries information. You ever heard of fiber optics? That is light transporting information. Light reveals, exposes. Darkness, on the other hand, is merely the absence of light. The only information it conveys is that there is no information. It reveals and exposes nothing, for it is nothing. Spiritual light is all that is good and holy, as the Bible defines those terms, whereas spiritual darkness is all that is bad and evil. There is no sin in the light, whereas darkness is the very essence of sin. John was very concerned about sin in the lives of his little children. Therefore, expanding on the verse just quoted, he made the following declaration. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. That's 1 John 1st chapter 6 and 7. Walking in the light means one must abide in the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9. We cannot practice sin, that is, walking in darkness, and have fellowship with God, that is, walking in light. Darkness and light do not mix. But if we practice righteousness and keep on practicing righteousness, then we are walking in the light and may rightly fellowship those who are also walking in the light. <clears throat> Furthermore, just as physical light has the potential to purify, spiritual light can purify the soul. How? The light of the gospel, that is, the truth of the gospel that sets men free, God's power to save, Romans 1:16 tells us that it is the blood of Christ that cleanses us from the guilt of sin. 
<clears throat> to benefit continually from such cleansing blood, one must continually walk in the light of the gospel. To walk in the light of the gospel is to abide in the doctrine of Christ. To abide in the doctrine of Christ is to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. The continual cleansing from sin, therefore, is conditional on continually walking in light. John recognized that all mankind has sinned, except for the God-man Jesus, Romans 3.23. Otherwise, he would not have written thusly, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John 1st chapter, verse 8. 1 John, if we, say, if we were to say otherwise, we would be deceiving ourselves. There is a continual need for the means to cleanse us of our sins. That means is declared in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Based on the verb form used in the original Koine Greek, that's the present tense, there is a continual confessing of our sins as committed, even for those committed unwittingly. There is no self-deception, but a ready, ready willingness to repent and seek the forgiveness of God. Once again, John reminds the reader in verse 10 that if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Once again, the child of God recognizes that he has offended God by engaging in sin and needs the forgiveness of his heavenly Father. God has said that all have sinned. If we were to say that we have not sinned, then we make his word null and void, and him a liar. Two contradictory views cannot both be the correct. But God cannot lie, Titus 1, verse 2, and Hebrews 6, verse 18. But man can lie to others and to himself. That is self-deception. The word of truth and the word of a lie cannot exist together in harmony. Like God, John does not want anyone to sin. In 1 John, the second chapter, verse 1, we read that the previous uh, verses were written out of John's concern for his little children, that they may not sin. He changes the tense of the uh, verb sin or sins. He changes the tense of that used here from the present tense to the aorist tense. The import of this change is to emphasize that the things written previously should encourage one not to sin a single time. But he knows that man will occasionally commit a sin without it ever being a habitual sinner. In 1 John 2nd chapter verses 1 and 2 we read, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. The word translated here, advocate, is the same word translated as helper in the New King James Version or comforter in the King James Version, the ASV Version, in uh, chapters 14, 15, 16 of the Gospel account according to John. Here it has the meaning of legal representation, that is, pleading on the behalf of another. The one who has the benefit of the advocate is not the habitual sinner, but the one who sins occasionally and readily confesses those sins. Jesus, our high priest, is sitting on the right hand of God, Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and makes intercession for us, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. And he does it for the one addressed in this verse. It is a great comfort for the faithful Christian that is, that one is sitting on the right hand of God 
for the specific purpose of interceding on his behalf. The one standing to be judged cannot plead innocence because he is not. But Jesus can, Jesus can say that his blood has washed away his sins and he therefore stands justified and uncondemned. Because his blood, that's Jesus' blood, was offered in atonement for sin, it can be rightly <clears throat> said that he is the propitiation for our sins, that is, uh, for those who continually confess their sins and are forgiven. He can say in the presence of the majesty on high, <clears throat> Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 21 and 23. It is not for these only, but for those who habitually practice sin, that Jesus shed his blood. Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans, as recorded in chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, that for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. However, because they do not walk in the light, do not admit they have sinned, do not confess those sins, they will stand before the throne of heaven and have the great advocate say, that they have not been washed in his blood and therefore stand condemned. John further adds that we can know that we know him. To know him is to be washed in his blood. To be washed in his blood is to be in a saved condition. For one to say that he cannot be certain that he is uh, saved is to ignore the proof uh, of such offered by John. John wrote... In 1 John, the second verse, uh, second chapter, verses 3 through 6. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to himself also walk just as he walked. That's in the light. If one keeps his commandments, that one knows him. If one knows him, then he walks just as Jesus walked, that is, in the light. One who keeps his word keeps his commandments, walks in the light, and continues steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. One who keeps his word has a love of God abiding in him. Perhaps then we can say, as did the Apostle Paul in Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 9 through 11, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So, if you have not received the reconciliation, if you, have not, if you are not walking in the light as he is in the light, if you are not keeping his commandments as set forth in the New Testament, then you do not have an advocate with the Father. But you can. It's very easy to render obedience to our Savior, and therefore you have Him representing you before the uh, throne of heaven. If you have not, or some other uh, sin in your life that has separated you from your God, we won't allow time tonight for that to be uh, corrected as we stand and sing.